This is an introduction to Workers' Power, uh, the selected writings of Maurice Brinton, edited by David Goodway, and the introduction is by David Goodway. Maurice Brinton was the principal writer, translator, and thinker of the Solidarity Group, which was at its most active and exerted greatest influence in Britain during the 1960s and the first half of the 1970s. It was a section of the old left which broke away to become, it can be now seen, part of the new left, although it has never been accepted as such, especially since it almost immediately passed beyond any recognizable Marxism to a fully left libertarian position, while largely holding back from the self-description of, quote, anarchist. Brinton, in particular, has always been extremely critical of anarchism and the anarchists, denying that he himself is an anarchist, only being comfortable with the appellation of, quote, libertarian socialist, end quote. Because of the way in which his writing has fallen between the poles of Marxist humanism and anarchism, because it overwhelmingly appeared in cyclo-style publications, never being reprinted by mainstream publishers, and because of his own pseudonymous, pseudonymous, pseudonymous stat existence, <laughs> pseudonymous existence, Maurice Brinton has never received the recognition that the quality of his political output deserves. It is the intention of this ample sampling of his work to begin to rectify this deplorable state of affairs. Although in the late 60s and early 70s, Solidarity's ambition was to inspire by its example a major movement, and indeed at one time or another at least 25 groups existed in London and elsewhere, in terms of numbers its membership was never appreciable. Solidarity's significance lay not in its size but in the excellence of its publications. The group was initially called, quote, Socialism Reaffirmed, end quote, and its journal first appeared in October 1960 under the title of Agitator, redolent of the Trotskyist origins mm -hmm. of most of the group's founding members. But from the sixth issue, May 1961, it became Solidarity. It seems significant that both the IWW and the Shop Stewards and Workers Committee movement, with their very similar industrial politics, had published journals with the na same name. Solidarity was the striking subtitle of For Workers' Power. Excuse me, Solidarity with the striking subtitle For Workers' Power came out every two to four months until 1977 when there was a merger with the Social Revolution Group resulting in Solidarity for Social Revolution. Around 1982, the original London group resumed publication of Solidarity, eventually adopting the subtitle of A Journal of Libertarian Socialism. Yet after 31 issues of the new series, the paper folded in 1992 and the group is now defunct. In parallel to the journal, there were more than 60 impressive pamphlets and four important books. It was through the circulation of the pamphlets in particular that a wider radical readership was aware of the group's ideas, and it was through the excellence of its journal, pub pamphlets, and books in general that Solidarity exerted significant influence in the 1960s and 1970s amongst anarchists and libertarian socialists. For a few months, in the early 1960s, Solidarity exercised a key role on the national level in shaping the outlook of the most militant sections of the nuclear disarmament movement. CND, Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, had been launched in 1958, but by autumn 1960, dissatisfaction with its legal methods and constitutional actions spawned within it the Direct Action Committee of 100. Unequivocally opposed to all nuclear weapons, unlike Soviet sympathizers, embedded in CND's leadership or the Trotskyist Socialist Labor League, with its risable defense of the, quote, workers' bomb, end quote, the Committee of 100 was the most important anarchist, or at least near-anarchist, political organization of modern Britain. The two best-known anarchists of the time, Herbert Reed and Alex Comfort, were among its approximately 100 members, while two more anarchists, Augustus John and George Melly were also members, and another, A.S. Neal, a supporter. The Committee of 100 called for mass civil disobedience against the preparation for nuclear war, 
and its sit-downs in central London reached their peak in September 1961, when, with Bertrand Russell, its 89-year-old president, and 31 other members in prison, 12,000 sat down in Trafalgar Square, and 1,300 were arrested. The failure of the demonstration at the Weathersfield Air Base in December, however, led to the decentralization of the committee into 13 regional committees, several of which were already existent. Although there was a nominal, a nominal national committee of 100, the dominant body was to be the London Committee of 100, set up in April 1962. It was now that the Solidarity Group became, quote, one of the most important influences in the Committee of 100, end quote. In, quote, in 1962, 1963, and beyond, end quote. The most authoritative historian of the nuclear disarmament movement concludes, quote, it was in practice a combination of solidarity and anarchist activists, anarchistic activists who constituted the militant hardcore of the committee in the period, end quote. That's from Richard Taylor against the bomb, the British Peace Movement, 1958 to 1965, published in 1988. The long, harsh winter of 1962 to 3, one of the 20th century's worst, saw a renewed crisis, now acted out within the London Committee of 100. The radicals, mainly from or close to solidarity, circulated the arrestingly titled discussion document, quote, beyond counting asses, or arses, end quote. Advocating radical subversive action, quote, we must attempt to hinder the warfare state in every possible way, end quote. It was essentially this group who constituted the spies for peace, locating and breaking into the regional seat of government at Warren Row, Berkshire, and producing the pamphlet, Danger, Official Secret, RSG-6, thereby many of us on the all Aldermaston March of Easter, 1963, were diverted to explore the sinister surface buildings of the subterranean bunker. The anarchist Nicholas Walter was the only member of the Spies for Peace ever to declare himself or herself publicly of the eight two were women. Footnote. Walter did so unambiguously as early as 1968, remarkably, and on the radio at that. But in general, okay, it's just a bunch of essays that it's referencing. Um, for a short time, Nicholas Walter was very close to Solidarity, attending its group meetings and writing Pamphlet 15, the RSG's 1919-1963, to which detailed the historical development of the regional seats of government. The distinctiveness of Solidarity's politics was primarily twofold. There was its irreverent, humorous iconoclasm of all left orthodoxies, the importance and novelty of which cannot be stressed too much, since the self-important ideologues of the far left have little sense of the comic. This was combined with the publication of writings of Paul Cardan, who was Cornelius Castoriadis. Quote, We are ourselves, and nothing more. We live here and now, not in Petrograd 1917, nor in Barcelona in 1936. We have no gods, not even revolutionary ones. Paraphrasing Marx, quote, philosophers have only interpreted the world. What is necessary is to change it, end quote. We might say that, quote, revolutionaries have only interpreted Marx or Bakunin. What is necessary is to change them, end quote. Quote, we are the products of the degeneration of traditional politics and of the revolt of youth against established society in an advanced industrial country in the second half of the 20th century. The aim of this book is to give both purpose and meaning to this revolt, and to merge it with the constant working-class struggle for its own emancipation." End quote. This is from the introduction, printed in full below, in Solidarity's second book, Cardin's Modern Capitalism and Revolution, 1965. In addition to texts by him in the journal, Solidarity also brought out nine pamphlets by Cardin. Socialism Reaffirmed, 1960, The Meaning of Socialism, Socialism or Barbarism, 
crisis, the crisis of modern society, from Bolshevism to the bureaucracy, history and revolution, a revolutionary critique of historical materialism, workers' councils and the economics of a self-managed society, redefining revolution, and history as creation. Footnote. A tenth pamphlet, The Fate of Marxism, published by Solidarity, reprinted a text that had originally appeared in Solidarity 4, Volume 4, Issue 3. End of footnote. With the publication of the last, Paul Cardan was finally revealed as one of the pseudonyms of Cornelius Castoriadis, Pierre Chaloux, and Jean-Marc Coudre were other were two others. Cornelius Castoriades had been born in 1922 in Istanbul or Constantinople as it was still called. Grown up in Athens, joined the Greek Communist Party as a teenager, but moved to Trotskyism during the Second World War and was involved in the resistance against the German occupation. Under threat of death from both fascists and Stalinists, Castoriadis escaped to France in 1945 and, as a statistical economist, became a high-ranking official of the OEEC, Organization for European Economic Cooperation, superseded in 1961 by the OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Where's my drink? Need some water. Fuck. By 1949, Castoriadis was a founding editor of Socialism Obabri, which ran until 1965. With Situationism, Socialism Obabri was to be a prime influence in the events of May 1968. Daniel Cohn-Bendit, in particular, gladly acknowledged his, quote, plagiarism, end quote. Although the future postmodernist Jean-Francois Lyotard was also a member of the group, the other principal theorist in Socialism au Babouille was Claude Lefort until he broke in 1958 to form the Information et Liaison Ouvrière, transformed into Information, Information et Correspondance which was to be another influence on Cohn Bendit. For solidarity, socialism, obabri, were, quote, our French co thinkers, end quote. Castoriadis not only considered that Western capitalism was becoming increasingly authoritarian through a process of bureaucratization, which would eventually lead to totalitarianism, a process that impelled its working classes to revolt. He also believed that in the Soviet Union, the bureaucracy had formed a new ruling class. What was crucial was not who owned the means of production, but who controlled the means of production. Russian capitalism was a higher form into which Western capitalism was developing. The proletariat, quote, never frees itself completely, end quote, outside of production, quote, from the influence of the capitalist environment in which it lives, end quote. On the other hand, quote, in the course of production, the class constantly creates the elements of a new form of social organization and of a new culture, end quote. So Castoriadis came to advance a society self-managed by autonomous workers, a prescription that was central to Solidarity's politics. And in France, his notion of autogestion did come to, ex to exercise some considerable appeal in the 1970s, quote, the Commune of 1871, the Soviets of 1905 and 1917, 
the Russian factory committees of 1917 to 18, the German workers' councils of 1919 and 1920, the Italian factory committees of 1921, the council set up by the Spanish workers in 1936 to 37, the Hungarian workers' councils of 1956 were at one and the same time organs of struggle against the ruling class and the ruling class's state and new forms of social organization based on principles radically opposed to those of bourgeois society. End quote. These quotations are taken from Castoriadis's quote, Proletariat et Organisation, or organ, Organisation, <laughs> Organis, uh, Organ, fuck it. <laughs> Proletariat and Organization, I think is the translation there, which first appeared in Socialism ou Barbary in 1959 and was translated as, quote, working class consciousness, end quote, in Solidarity in 1962. Solidarity regarded it as so, quote, basic a statement of our views, end quote, that they broke with custom by reprinting it seven years later. Quote, organs of struggle against the ruling class and its state, new forms of social organization based on principles radically opposed to those of bourgeois society, end quote. This is the kind of potentially solid, this is the kind of potential solidarity conceived the Committee of 100 is having. It should also be apparent that Castoriadis's position in this article is indistinguishable from anarchism. In 1970, Castoriadis retired from the OECD, becoming a French citizen, and then, in 1974, a psychoanalyst. Castoriadis began to reprint his early political writings and for the first time to write books, now using his real name, rather than advocating, quote, socialism, end quote. By the end of the 70s, he had come instead to use the term, quote, autonomous society, end quote. But solidarity, which had otherwise followed in his theoretical wake, did not do likewise. Castoriadis died in Paris in 1997. Footnote, the secondary literature, at least in English, on Socialism ou Barbary and Castoriadis is limited and unreliable. It got off to a bad start with George Lichtheim, Marxism in Modern France. Witheringly reviewed by Brinton in Solidarity, Volume 4, Issue 10, in November 1967. The first edition of Dick Howard, The Marxian Legacy, is even more decisively dismissed by E.P. Thompson, The Poverty of Theory and Other Essays. There is also Richard Gombin, The Origins of Modern Leftism, Mark Poster, Existential Marxism in Postwar France from Sartre to Althusser, Richard Gombin, The Radical Tradition, A Study in Modern Revolutionary Thought, Alex Kalinikos, Trotskyism, Sunil Kilnani, Arguing Revolution, The Intellectual Left in Post-War France. Much more rewarding are André Liebich, Socialism au Barbary, A Radical Critique of Bureaucracy, published in 1977. Alex Richards, The Academization of Castoy Otis, published in 1988. And above all, two primary texts. An interview with C. Castoriadis, Telos, nineteen, uh, Telos number twenty-three, spring nineteen seventy-five, and quote an interview with Claude Lafour, Telos number thirty. Obituaries of Castoriadis appeared in Guardian on the thirty-first of December nineteen ninety-seven. Okay, this now it's just getting tedious. Okay, so where was that? Where did that footnote end? Okay. While an American solidarist called Owen Cahill did some of the earlier Cardan translations, these were always revised by Maurice Brinton, who in any case wrote all the introductions and translated the bulk of the text. It was Brinton and Ken Weller 
who were and remained the principal figures in a talented group. Weller was a young London engineer and AEU amalgamated engineering union shop steward. It was he who is largely responsible for Solidarity's extensive industrial coverage and analysis, for which in the 1960s it seemed most likely the group would be principally remembered. Brinton is an immensely gifted intellectual whose career is similar to Castoriadis's at several points. He was born in India in 1923 to a distinguished Anglo-Greek family, where his father decided to retire and return. When his father re decided to retire and return to Europe, he chose to settle in Switzerland, and in consequence, Britain, rece Britain received most of his schooling there, become f becoming fluent not only in English and Greek, but also French. He went up to Oxford University in 1941 to read medicine and instantly joined the Communist Party of Great Britain, but was almost immediately expelled on account of his criticism of its policy on the Second World War. He therefore moved on to Trotskyism in support of the Revolutionary Communist Party until 1946. The pursuit of his medical career then led to a temporary secession of all political activity. In 1957, Castoriadis was appointed as a consultant at a London teaching hospital, excuse me, in 1957, Brinton was appointed as a consultant at a London teaching hospital, and he then made contact with the group that became the SLL two years later. Under the autocratic leadership of Jerry Healy, this soon began to hemorrhage with the loss of many of its most able members. Um, for those who don't know, I believe Jerry Healy was involved in a very serious series of sex scandals where he was uh, sexually abusing several young female activists within the SLL. Not exactly sure of the details, but something to that effect was occurred. Uh, important controversy or important event in British left history, to my understanding... Uh, maybe, I don't know. It seems pretty horrific. It's pretty horrific to me. Reflecting on the bizarre bizarreries of the SLL, the Marxist historian John Seville comments, quote, Trotskyism was anti-Stalinist, of course, but their creeds were dogmatic, inflexible, and sectarian to quite a remarkable degree, end quote. Footnote. John Seville Memoirs from the Left, published by Merlin Press in 2003. End footnote. In 1960, Brinton, as a member of the SLL's National Committee, took part in the expulsion of a group that contained Ken Weller, but within several months he too had seceded. Brinton was already familiar with Socialism Ubabri, and together with Weller, more ex-SLL members, and some other dissident socialists formed, on the basis of the French journal's critique of Bolshevism, the Libertarian Socialism Reaffirmed Group, which was to be renamed Solidarity. Maurice Brinton is a pseudonym. He had carried over the name of Martin Granger from his SLL activism, and as such contributed the diary to the pamphlet of the Belgian general strike of 1960-61 to and jointly wrote the long article in the Paris Commune with Philippe Guillaume of Socialism Ubabri. In summer 1961, however, a right-wing press campaign led to his exposure and thereafter abandoning Martin Granger, all his political writings and translations have been either anonymous or signed Maurice Brinton or M.B. Unusually, I think, neither Martin Granger nor Maurice Brinton was chosen for any particular association, both composites probably being assembled through a random search in the telephone directory. And unlike Cornelius Castoriadis, he has no wish to resort to his real name. Although Brinton's writings 
for solidarity and its associated publications extended over a quarter of a century, he does not consider that he personally contributed theoretically regarding himself as merely the translator and transmitter of Castoriadis' ideas, as well as an activist who sought their practical application. In what, then, does Brinton's achievement consist? First, he has been assessed by Richard Taylor as, quote, the most dominant individual, end quote, within solidarity, and by some even better place to know, and by someone even better placed to know, Nicholas Walter, its, quote, main leader, end quote, or, quote, leading figure, end quote. All this is acknowledged by Ken Weller, regarded by Brinton as not just his closest political friend, but his best friend, Tout Corp, sentiments that are entirely reciprocated. Second, Brinton was the creative translator of Castoriadis, thereby introducing him when he was known as Paul Cardin to the Anglophone world and indeed beyond. With the exception of the four items, articles, and or pamphlets drawn from Marxism and Revolutionary Theory, which came to form part one of the major book, The Imaginary Institution of Society, published in 1975, All of Brinton's translations have been utilized in David Ames Curtis's massive three-volume edition, though covering only from 1946 to 1979 of the political and social writings of Castoriadis. Curtis goes so far indeed as to dedicate his very substantial and useful Castoriadis reader to Maurice Brinton. But Brinton both added and subtracted to Castoriadis' dense and frequently obscure text, making them accessible to political militants, not only working class, but middle class. His translations were, as Walter commented, quote, often improvements on Paul Cardin's originals, end quote. Brinton himself once explained, quote, our text is as close, excuse me, our text is a close, but not always literal translation of the French original. The milieu in which our pamphlet will be distributed and discussed differs from that of the 1957 article. Throughout, our main concern has been with getting essential concepts over to as wide and unspecialized an audience as possible. To a great extent, this has influenced our choice of wording and sentence structure. Paragraphs have been shortened. A number of sectional and chapter headings have been added. Some additional footnotes have been inserted, clearly indicated as solidarity footnotes. One or two of the original footnotes have been omitted, and one or two others incorporated into the text proper, which has been slightly shortened. End quote. In contrast, Curtis has dropped Burton, Brinton's popularizing elements and reverted to the originals despite their frequent turgidity. Thirdly, Brinton writes very well. He is lively, his style is punchy and accessible, and, is, and he possesses a wicked sense of humor. Especially noteworthy are his vivid eyewitness reports from upsurges of popular self-activity. The Belgian general strike of 1960-61, to 61, Paris in May 1968, and rural and urban Portugal in 1975 and 1976. He is a merciless reviewer and polemicist. And although in controversy... He can seem to get bogged down in finicky detail, as in France, the theoretical implications. Quote, solidarity and the neonarodniks and the factory committees and dictatorship of the proletariat. He always moves on to such bold and arresting generalizations that the effort of following his argument is fully rewarded. A definite limitation, though, is the repetitiveness of Brinton's prose. For example, in three of the articles reprinted here, as well as in The Irrational in Politics, he quotes Spinoza's tag, quote, neither to laugh nor to weep but to understand, and the splendid passage already cited from the introduction to Cardin's Modern Capitalism and Revolution reappears in As We Don't See It, as, quote, 
We want no gods, not even those of the Marxist or anarchist pantheons. We live in neither Petrograd of 1917 nor the Barcelona of 1936. We are ourselves, the products of the disintegration of traditional politics in an advanced capitalist country in the second half of the 20th century. End quote. It must be recalled that Brinton was following a crowded and successful career as a medical scientist, all his political writings being the product of his spare time, in this and other defining ways such as his concern with sexuality and his concern with the application of scientific method to, sociopolitical, to the sociopolitical realm, he resembles his anarchist contemporary Alex Comfort, for Comfort was also a great recycler of previously published material and repeater of well-turned phrases. In, it needs to be insisted, too, that Brinton wrote with no thought of eventual republication in a volume of the present kind. If he had been able to edit it himself, it would have been of considerable interest to see how much cutting and rewriting he would have subjected his prose to. Finally, despite his disclaimer, Brinton was responsible for original work in certain areas going beyond Castoriadis. The Irrational in Politics, a booklet originally published in 1970 and considered by one reviewer as Solidarity's best work to date, explores the role of sexual repression and authoritarian conditioning in generating socio-political conformity. While derivative of Wilhelm Reich, as Brinton fully acknowledges, he is here probing at that central matter of the proletariat outside of production never freeing itself, quote, completely from the influence of the environment in which it lives, end quote. He is able, very convincingly, to point to the sexual permissiveness of the 1960s as a major breakthrough in the, quote, undermining of tradition, end quote, and terminating a vicious cycle. Whereas for, quote, Reich, any large-scale sexual freedom was inconceivable within the framework of capitalism, end quote. The change in traditional attitudes is both gaining momentum and becoming more explicit in a manner which would have surprised and delighted him, end quote. On the other hand, the pessimism only four years later of his review, in which there is a rare glimpse of his professional expertise, to George Frankel's The Failure of the Sexual Revolution needs to be taken into consideration. Also dating from 1970 is Brinton's Chef de Vue, de Vue. I don't know how I'm saying that right. Uh, I guess uh, chief work, which Castoriadis was rightly to assess as, quote, remarkable, end quote. This is The Bolsheviks and Workers' Control, 1917 to 1921, The State and Counter-Revolution which originally appeared as a 100-page book tracing the obliteration of the Russian factory committees of 1917 to 1918, so that by 1921 Russian factories and trade unions had been subordinated to the new Bolshevik state and the party. Quote, In 1917 it had been proclaimed that, quote, every cook should learn to govern the state, end quote. By 1921 the state was clearly powerful enough to govern every cook, end quote. Extraordinarily, but significantly, this very necessary task had not previously been attempted, and the anarchist conclusions properly drawn are, quote, the basic question, who manages production after the overthrow of the bourgeoisie, should therefore now become the center of any serious discussion about socialism. Today, the old equation, liquidation of the bourgeoisie equals worker state, popularized by countless Leninists, Stalinists, and Trotskyists, is just not good enough, end quote. In his stimulating Rethinking the Russian Revolution, the highly regarded Russianist Edward Acton, reviewing the libertarian interpretation of the revolution, cites the Bolsheviks and workers' control more times than any of Berkman, Volin, Arshinov, or Maximov. This is quite a tribute. Brinton is well known in libertarian circles for Paris, May 1968, The Irrational in Politics, and The Bolsheviks and Workers' Control, three publications that have been widely read and admired and each has gone through a number of editions. In the case of The Irrational in Politics, 
In the first fi- in the five years after its first appearance, it had been translated into French, German, Swedish, and Greek, and been published in the USA, Canada, and Australia. Within little more than three years, the Bolsheviks and workers' control was translated into French, Dutch, German, Swedish, Spanish, Greek, and Japanese. Paris, May 1968 was not only the first pamphlet or book to be published as early as June 1968, but remains one of the best participant accounts there is of the, quote, events in France, end quote. A reviewer later that year acclaiming it for, quote, giving the clearest possible picture of what was actually happening. It managed to somehow capture the very flavor and essence of the inspiring movement taking place. Like no other publication, it carries with it the very smell of tear gas, the very guts of revolution, end quote. Since the three areas covered in these three works are so central in Brinton's output, related articles, reviews, and in one case a leaflet are here reprinted. It should be noted, though, that France, the theoretical implications, was considered sufficiently important by Solidarity for it to be appended in 1973 to the second edition of Paris, May 1968, while the introduction to the 1975 edition of The Irrational in Politics referred readers to the two reviews of Wilhelm Reich, and particularly to that of George Frankel's book. This still leaves a very considerable corpus of items of potential selection. A provisional checklist of Brinton's post-Trotskyist political publications has come up with at least 107 items, whether articles, pamphlets, book and film reviews, or translations, and in addition, there are many anonymous articles that, decades later, it is not possible to assign with certainty, as well as fugitive leaflets. Many of these would not be entirely his work. Solidarity editorials, statements such as as we see it and as we don't see it, and introductions would be would all be circulated within the group for criticism and rewriting, for Solidarity not merely advocated libertarian ultra-democracy, but actually practiced it. This is a reason, a major reason, for Brinton wishing to maintain his pseudonym, and in a very real sense his anonymity, regarding himself as merely the communicator of the group's collective position and analysis. But all the same, Brinton was the primary author of all the texts included in this selection, with the exception of the co-written The Commune, Paris, 1871. In 1960, Brinton abandoned the SLL and rejected Trotskyism, proceeding to draft the leaflet, Socialism Reaffirmed, dated October 1960, and the initial item reprinted here. That this document should be fully libertarian may seem extraordinary until it is recalled that he was already familiar with Socialism Ubabri, and indeed, at the same time, an article by Castoriadis from Socialism Ubabri No. 1 was published with the same title, Socialism Reaffirmed, as the new group's first pamphlet. In the leaflet, the, quote, fundamental contradiction of contemporary society, end quote, is identified as, quote, its division into those who own, manage, decide, and direct, and the majority who have to toil and are forced to comply with decisions they have not themselves taken, end quote. What the working class requires is, quote, a revolutionary organization, not as its self-appointed leadership, but as an instrument of the working class's struggle, end quote. This organization, quote, should anticipate the socialist future of society rather than mirror its capitalist past, end quote. The three criteria being that, quote, Local organs have the fullest autonomy, end quote. Direct democracy is practiced, quote, direct democracy is practiced wherever possible, end quote. And, quote, all central bodies having power of decision involving others should be constituted by delegates, these being elected by those who they represent and revocable by those they represent at any time, end quote. These points, as well as others in the leaf, that were to be reiterated in the years that followed and reappear constantly in the reprinted text. 
In Socialism Reaffirmed, Brinton quotes for the first time one of his favorite dictas of Marx's. The emancipation of the working class is the task of the workers themselves. He also counters Lenin's insistence, to which he is continually to return, that, quote, the workers can only develop a trade union consciousness, end quote, contending that the working class is, quote, capable of rising to the <laughs> very greatest heights of revolutionary consciousness and challenging the very basis of all exploiting regimes, end quote, by pointing to its achievements in the Paris Commune, the Russian revolutions of 1905 and 1917, the Spanish Revolution, and the Hungarian Revolution, a catalog that he was to repeat and to extend. And another major theme which Brinton touches on in Socialism Reaffirmed is not only that working class trade union and political organizations have now degenerated, expressing, quote, non-proletarian social interest, end quote, but that this degeneration has, quote, a subjective basis in the imposition of capitalist methods of thinking <coughs> and organization into the ranks of the labor movement, end quote. Thus, Brinton, excuse me, this Brinton develops, developed, this Brinton developed the following year in revolutionary organization. Quote, Exploiting society consciously encourages the development of a mass psychology to the effect that the ideas or wishes of ordinary people are unimportant and that all important decisions must be taken by people specially trained and specially equipped to do so. All the ruling groups in modern society encourage the belief that decision taking and management are functions beyond the comprehension of ordinary people. All means are used to foster this idea. Not only do formal education, the press, the radio, television, and the church perpetuate this myth, but even the parties of the so-called opposition accept it, and in so doing lend it strength. All the parties of the, quote, left, end quote, oppose the present order only by offering, quote, better, end quote, leaders, more, quote, experienced, end quote, and more capable of solving the problems of society than those who mismanage the world today, end quote. And so on. Quote, the Labour Party, Communist Party, and various Trotskyite and Leninist sects all extol the virtues of professional politicians or revolutionaries, all practice a rigid division within their own organizations of leaders and led, all fundamentally believe that socialism will be instituted from above and through their own particular agency. Each of them sees socialism as nothing more than the conquest of political power, the transformation by decree of economic institutions, the instruments of socialism in their eyes are nationalization, state control, and the, quote, plan, end quote. Fifteen years later, oh, end quote, end quote, end quote. <laughs> Fifteen years later, introducing Phil Mailer's Portugal, the impossible revolution, Brinton reflected gloomily on, quote, the risk of genuinely radical upheavals being deviated into state capitalist channels. It is the danger that any new creation in the realm of ideas, relationships, or institutions will immediately be pounced upon, penetrated, colonized, manipulated, and ultimately deformed by hordes of power-hungry, quote, professional revolutionaries, end quote. These people bring with them attitudes and patterns of behavior deeply, if not always consciously, molded by Lenin's notion that the workers left to themselves, quote, can only develop a trade union consciousness, end quote. The current organizational practices and their prescriptions for the future are bureaucratic to the core. Their preoccupation with leadership destroys initiative. Their concern for the correct line discourages experiment. Their obsession with the past is a blight on the future. They create around themselves a wasteland of cynicism and disgust, of smashed hopes and disillusion, that betrays the deepest dogma of, the bourgeois, of bourgeois society, namely that ordinary people are incapable of solving their own problems by themselves and for themselves, end quote. His prediction was that, quote, in future upheavals, the traditional revolutionaries will prove, quote, part of the problem, not part of the solution, end quote, end quote. In contrast, revolutions in the past could either be defeated by those whose privileges they sought to destroy, as with the Paris Commune, Germany in 1918-19, to Spain and Hungary, or, quote, they could be destroyed from within through bureaucratic degeneration, as happened to the Russian Revolution of 1917, end quote. 
It is with the latter that the degeneration of the Russian Revolution that Brinton is obsessed in his writings, and when I first encountered him back in 1963, inviting him to speak to the Oxford Anarchist Group, this was the topic he chose. In 1961, he introduced for solidarity the section on Kronstadt from Victor Serge's Memoirs of a Revolutionary, a major work not then available in English, and this was the later... And this was later published as a pamphlet, Kronstadt, 1921. There followed in 1962 his impressive edition of Alexander Kollontai's The Workers' Opposition, Pamphlet 7, reprinted for the first time in English since its original appearance in 1921 in Sylvia Pankhurst's Workers' Dreadnought as, quote, a contribution to the great discussion now taking place concerning, quote, what went wrong, end quote, end quote. Brenton next produced the English translation of Ida Metz, The Kronstadt Commune, Pamphlet 27, Finally, in 1970 came the outstanding and very original, The Bolsheviks and Workers' Control, his study of how the Bolsheviks defeated the revolution in the factories. This relentless preoccupation with the Russian Revolution, whereas the achievements of the Spanish Revolution is only ever mentioned in passing, may perplex readers only familiar with world politics since the collapse of communism. But those who recall any part of the period between 1917 and 1989 will attest how central analysis of the apparently, quote, actually existing socialism, end quote, of Russia, China, and their satellite slave states was not just to Stalinist, Trotskyist, and other Marxist-Leninists, but even to anarchists and social democrats. All the same, Brenton's Trotskyist past and his belief during those years that the Soviet Union was a, quote, deformed worker state, end quote, clearly molded his mindset set, and range of reference for many years to come. As late as the early 1970s, a, public, a, publicity, leaf, a publicity leaflet for the Bolsheviks and workers' control addresses those who were still Trotskyist. Comrades, you have more or less seen through Stalinism. Now shed your illusions your last illusions. You can't fight bureaucracy by bureaucratic methods. Why cling to the Leninist and Trotskyist myths? Let the dead bury the dead. One more effort to total demystification and to become real revolutionaries. An article he wrote as, quote, Martin Granger for the group which would shortly become the Socialist Labor League in the issue of its weekly celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution illustrates how well the intellectually impoverished automatism illustrates well the intellectually impoverished automatism that was requisite. Quote, how they took power in Petrograd, end quote, is a breathless chronology, quote, from February to October, end quote. Only three years separate the unthinking piety of this fourth-rate piece from the subversive radicalism of socialism reaffirmed. Yet the passage from the parrot cry orthodoxy of Trotskyism to an innovative libertarianism is not peculiar to Brenton and some of his fellow solidarists in Britain. In France, Castori, Otis, and Lafour, and Socialism ou Barbary had led the way to libertarian socialism, and Daniel Gorin was later to move to an outright anarchism. In the United States, Murray Bookchin, previously a Trotskyist for many years, became an excitingly original anarchist thinker. Also in the States, C.L.R. James, Raya Donayevskaya, and their Johnson Forest tendency moved to a distinctive libertarian socialism, as James continued to do after being deported to Britain in 1953. Indeed, there were close relations between socialism ubabari and the Johnson Forest tendency for ten years, Castoriadis contributing with James and Grace Lee to Facing Reality, 1958. I didn't know Castoriadis wrote an article about C.L.R. James. That'll be interesting to read. I have an article about C.L.R. James by, I think his name's Matthew Quest from, uh, the article was published in Insurgent Notes, edited by Lauren Goldner and I think someone else, I can't remember who the other person is, something gar gravy? Gar Garvey? Harvey? <laughs> I don't know, something like that. And, uh, that he criticizes C.L.R. James for never actually sufficiently breaking with Leninism or acknowledging Lenin's role in the um, uh, de-democratization of the Bolshevik or Russian Revolution and uh, the depletion of Soviet power. I don't think C.L.R. James ever, ever even criticized the, uh, the 
banning of sex within the Leninist parties that outlawed the workers' opposition. Um, so it kind of seems like C.L.R. James's you know, supposed libertarianism uh, was very much incomplete, at least in terms of historical analysis. Anyway, who cares what I have to say? Uh, put that in brackets. <laughs> So Trotskyism has possessed an impressive capacity for generating some of the most outstanding modern anarchists and libertarian socialists, notably not only for their fresh thinking, but also their theoretical rigor. There can be no doubt that Brinton's primary intellectual influence is that of Castoriadis, and only secondarily their mutual indebtedness, great thought, uh, their mutual indebtedness, great though it is, to Marx. Between 1961 and 1964, Castoriadis published in Socialism Ubabri, Marxism and Revolutionary Thought, in which he broke decisively with Marxism. Brinton translated in 1966 a first installment of this substantial text as The Fate of Marxism, which initially appeared in Solidarity and was later reprinted by Solidarity, Clydeside, as a pamphlet of the same title. In The Fate of Marxism, Castoriadis argues that, quote, for the last 40 years, Marxism has become an ideology in the meaning that Marx himself attributed to the word ideology. Marxism has become a system of ideas which relate to reality, not in order to clarify reality and to transform reality, but on the contrary, in order to mask reality and justify reality in the abstract, end quote. He concludes, quote, uh, Castoriadis concludes, quote, We have now reached the stage where a choice confronts us to remain Marxist or to remain revolutionaries, end quote. Brinton's comment is that this text, quote, is bound to infuriate those who have never had a new idea of their own, end quote, alluding to one of his favorite aphorisms applied throughout to all sections of the left, not least the anarchist, and only attributed in Capitalism and Socialism a rejoinder, rejoinder to the Victorian writer, Walter Bagahot, or Bagahot, quote, one of the greatest pains to human nature is the pain of a new idea, end quote. One of Brinton's major strengths is his ability to relish, quote, the pain of a new idea, end quote, but it was not until 1972 that he published another extract from Marxism and Revolutionary Thought, and in which this time Castoriadis ditched historical materialism as the pamphlet History and Revolution, Brinton defended this, quote, revolutionary critique of historical materialism, end quote, declaring that, quote, I've enjoyed writing this article, firstly because the discarding of an illusion is like the shedding of a load. One moves about more freely without it. Second, because to help demystify others, far from being, quote, barren, end quote, is a fruitful activity in itself, end quote. He explains, quote, in both modern capitalism and revolution and history and revolution, Cardan, Castoriadis, demands that revolutionaries apply to Marxism itself one of the most profound of Marx's insights, that the dominant ideas of each epoch are the ideas of that epoch's ruling class. Marx wrote in a period of full bourgeois ascendancy. It would have been a miracle if some bourgeois ideas had not permeated his own writings, end quote. While Brinton continues to believe in the continuing validity of such features of Marxism as, quote, the class struggle, the concept of surplus value, the theory of alienation, the importance of economic factors and historical development, the need ruthlessly to demystify ide all ideologies, end quote, Marxist economics and the materialist conception of history are in contrast, quote, suspect, end quote. He concurs with the identification of, quote, the alien bourgeois element, end quote, in the Marxist interpretation of history, for Castoriadis, quote, sees it in the attempt by Marx and Engels to apply to the whole of human history certain categories and relationships which are not transcendental, but which are themselves the product of historical development, and more particularly of the rise of the bourgeoisie. Among such historical, non-transcendental categories and relationships, he stresses, two, 
the notion of the primacy of the economy and the concept of a certain pattern of interaction, determination, between economic, quote, infrastructure and ideological, quote, superstructure, end quote. The rejection of these categories and patterns onto other areas of history with a view to constructing a universal and, quote, scientific, end quote, theory of history can only be achieved through a systematic rape of the facts, end quote. That is like a, that is super interesting because so many people say this. I think that, you know, this is kind of like um, what the whole critique of uh, technological determinist Marxism is represented by, for example, you know, the bulk of traditional Marxism, uh, but in like, I guess in the past 50 years or so, uh, G.A. Cohen's, uh, a def what's it, a def Marxist uh, interpretation of history, a defense or a defense of Marx's interpretation of history or... Um, which uh, there's been a whole uh, slew of people that have uh, critiqued that, but it's also um, the very fact that that book by G. A. Cohen won the Isaac Deutscher Prize when it came out kind of speaks to how uh, prevalent that kind of technological determinist Marxism uh, was at that time and has been historically. And it's very interesting that um, Castoriadis is like. Uh, right here is rejecting that kind of trans-historicization of particular features of capitalism that uh, a lot of people today, uh, including a lot of people who I think would uh, subscribe in some sense to value form analysis or political Marxism by people like, you know, Ellen Mason's Wood and Robert Brenner, to uh, some extent accusing Marxists of a certain Smithianism of projecting categories of capitalism back to a, a telos of history where there's a there's the constant break uh, natural progression of the productive forces wanting to break free uh, and uh, that's kind of and they reject that and that the rejection of that kind of teleological marxism is uh seems almost commonplace now so it does, and it seems like it's done by people who are uh, definitely would call themselves Marxists. So it's kind of like, yeah, it seems to me, or at least maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong, just wrong in this. But it seems like to like to um to really try to get like in detail about what it means when someone like I don't know Carl Korsch or Cat Cornelius Castoriadis say something to the effect of like they're breaking with Marxism. Like, what is that? What are they breaking with in particular? I mean, if it says right here, like in the, like, you know, uh, Brinton held on to, uh, what was it? The theory of surplus value and alienation and the importance of uh, economic factors in the, in historical development and uh, all those kinds of things. Like, what, what exactly are you abandoning? It seems like it's just like, a knee-jerk urge to uh, abandon an ideological, uh, unscientific interpretation of Marxism, maybe what you might call worldview Marxism, as opposed to just to uh, assessing the works of Marx and people that are operating within his tradition based upon their scientific merits and not on, like, you know, keeping a faith or something like that. But anyway... Uh, like I said, don't listen to me. But I'm the one reading, so I get to say whatever I want. Anyway, introducing redefining revolution in 1974, Brinton explained, quote, In a chemical reaction, there is no element of choice. The water in the kettle cannot choose not to boil when the kettle is placed on the fire, end quote. Quote, social development, end quote, however, quote, cannot be brought down to the level of chemical reaction. There is a choice wherever people are concerned, end quote. Positivism, determinism, and Marxism are all replaced by a philosophical and postmodern libertarianism. Quote, if a, quote, scientific, end quote, theory of history can predict history, there is no such thing as genuine choice. If it cannot, then, quote, scientific, end quote, interpretations of the past are subject to the same limitations as similar prediction of the future, end quote. This is from the introduction to the fourth installment of Marxism and Revolutionary Thought 
published as History as Creation in 1978. What is now central for Brinton and Castoriadis is, quote, genuine creation, end quote, quote, the act of producing and affairs, end quote, quote, such creation plays a major role in history, end quote, by, quote, its very nature, end quote, defying, quote, the dictates of predetermination. As Brinton is increasingly emancipated from the shackles of Marxism-Leninism in the form of Trotskyism, and eventually indeed from any form of Marxism, he becomes correspondingly creative and daring in his writing. While fully revealing, revealed during the 1970s, this was becoming apparent by the late 1960s. As early as 1965, he can celebrate, quote, the balkanization of utopia, end quote. Quote, there is no one road to utopia, no one organization or profit or party destined to lead the masses to the promised land. There is no one historically determined objective, no single vision of a different and new society, no solitary economic panacea that will do away with the alienation of man from his fellow man and from the products of, products of his own activity." End quote. Brenton even concludes that this is, quote, the sole guarantee that, quote, utopia, end quote, if we ever get near it, will be worth living in, end quote a pluralist belief remote from Trotskyism or indeed, quote, class struggle anarchism, end quote. Quote, class struggle anarchism. While he continued to believe that, quote, in modern industrial society, socialist consciousness springs from the real conditions of social life, end quote, he came to emphasize the importance of the non-economic realm of exploitation as, quote, capitalism and socialism, End quote. In 1968, quote, capitalism and socialism being the title of an essay, but sometimes uh, I just start reading the quotation marks and it feels awkward. I should just say the title of the thing. Anyway, quote, a society in which relations between people are based on domination will maintain authoritarian attitudes in relation to sex and to education, attitudes creating deep inhibitions, frustrations, and much unhappiness. From his earliest days, man is subjected to constant pressure designed to mold his views in relation to work, to culture, to leisure, to thought itself. The socialist revolution will have to take all these fields within its compass, and immediately not in some far distant future. The revolution must, of course, start with the overthrow of the exploiting class and with the institution of workers' management of production. But it will immediately have to tackle the reconstruction of social life in all of social life's aspects. If it does not, it will surely die." End quote. And in 1970, he introduced in the concluding section, Limits and Perspectives, of the title essay of The Irrational in Politics, the extremely important concept of recuperation, which had originated with the Situationist, explicating it more fully four years later in The Malaise on the Left. Quote, Over the last few decades, and in many different areas, established society has itself brought about a number of things that the revolutionaries of yesterday were demanding. This has happened in relation to economic attitudes, in relation to certain forms of social organization, and in relation to various aspects of the personal and sexual revolutions, end quote. It is legitimate, he says, to refer to this adaptation as, quote, recuperation, end quote, when it actually benefits the established society, contributing to its continuance as an exploiting hierarchy. Brinton's politics are fully anarchist. In his analysis of existing society, in his vision of a socialist society, and in the means he advocates in order to get from here to there. On the other hand, he has resolutely rejected much of anarchism and refused to describe himself as any sort of anarchist. The affiliation that satisfies him is rather libertarian socialism. A raft of issues fill him with scorn for most varieties of anarchism, whereas he highlights the need both to tackle an, on board excuse me, to take on board new ideas and to supplement emotion with understanding, he comments acidly in his note on Kropotkin that, quote, anarchist abstentionism in both areas seem to be as old as the hills, end quote. Fifteen years later in About Ourselves Too, one of the final texts in this collection, he returns to the first charge, quote, 
It is necessary to break decisively with the anti-modernism of tr the traditional anarchist milieu. It is no longer relevant to rely on the experience of the Spanish Revolution as the paradigm of revolutionary practice. It is pointless today to center our theoretical discussions on the debates of the anarchist movement of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The world has changed since then. The second criticism, end quote, the second criticism he develops by arguing that it is also, quote, necessary to counter the blind actionism found in many anarchists. To change the world, it is necessary to interpret the world. The, quote, refusal of thought, end quote, so prevalent in the anarchist milieu, which is closely related to its predilection for outdated models of revolution, has done untold harm to the cause of libertarian social revolution, end quote. Most anarchists include in either excuse me, most anarchists incline either to the insurrectionism of Bakunin or the communism of Kropotkin, but Brinton, in his review of Paul Average's The Russian Anarchist, has no time for either man. Regarding the former as muddle-headed and, and an authoritarian conspirator, and the latter as a romantic visionary who pined for a pastoral utopia, quote, oblivious of the complex forces at work in the modern world, End quote. In contrast, he approves of the anarcho-syndicalist G.P. Maximov and also Idemet, the platformist author of the Kronstadt Commune, who represents, quote, what is best in the revolutionary tradition of, quote, class struggle, end quote, anarchism, end quote. Quote, she thinks in terms of a collective proletarian solution to the problems of capitalism, end quote, as opposed to, quote, the rejection of the class struggle and anti-intellectualism, the preoccupation with transcendental morality and with personal salvation that characterize so many of the anarchists of today, end quote. Finally, there is the central matter of organization. In his introduction to Marie Bookchin's, Bookchin's On Spontaneity and Organization, Brinton equates Bookchin's understanding of, quote, spontaneity with his own notion of, quote, autonomy, as developed in Solidarity and the neo neurotniks concurring that, quote, spontaneity does not preclude organization and structure, end quote, but that spontaneity, quote, yields non-hierarchical forms of organization, end quote. While it is, of course, a fallacy that anarchism and organization are incompatible, some anarchists have always opposed organization, and it is understandable, highly regrettable, though it is, that Bookchin, who after many years contesting anti-organizational and, quote, lifestyle, end quote, anarchist, and sharing very similar theoretical and political perspectives, as well as background to Brinton, he has now ceased to call himself an anarchist. It has already been mentioned that some of Brinton's best writings consist of his first-hand descriptions of major upsurges of popular self-activity. He was present for the opening days of the Belgian general strike of 1960-61, to and from the end of the decade came the widely read Paris May 1968. Just a side note, I think that might have, I think the reason I'm reading Brenton, it's kind of like touching, I don't want to say a uh, nostalgia or something like that, but one of the first things I read that I suppose was from a uh, uh, class struggle libertarian uh, communist perspective was probably the Brenton essays that were reprinted in by uh, Prol.info. And uh, so I think that Paris, May 1968 might have been one of the first things I read that kind of came out of this tradition. I'm not sure, but it's definitely one of them. It is remarkable that it was through chance that he happened to be already in France for other reasons and hence was able to produce the two pamphlets. On the other hand, he was obliged to take holidays to visit Portugal in 1975 and 1976 in order to write Portuguese Diary 1 and 2. It was virtually automatic that he should cover Solidarność in 1980 in Suddenly This Summer, but he did not visit Poland to do so. The common themes are admiration for the creativity of ordinary people and struggle, and contempt for the degeneration, Stalinism, and political irrelevance of the Communist parties, the vanguardist, vanguardist presumption of the Trotskyists and Malice, and the corruption and bureaucracy of the social democratic parties and trade unions. There is much reference to, quote, bureaucracy, and, quote, the bureaucratic, end quote, in Brenton's writing, but in the text reprinted here, it is not until Factory Committees and the Dictatorship, an article of 1975, that a definition is provided. 
that a bureaucracy is, quote, a group seeking to manage from the outside the activities of others, end quote. If that is bureaucracy, it is a perennially recurring feature of human societies and equally to be perennially resisted, but by what is to be it to be replaced? It is in the malaise on the left that Brinton defines socialism as, quote, the creation of forms of living that will enable all, free from external constraints or internalized inhibitions, to rise to their full stature, to fulfill themselves as human beings, to enjoy themselves, to relate to one another without treading on anybody, end quote. Introducing Portugal, the impossible revolution, Brinton asks, quote, can one imagine any socialism worth living under without self-managed individuals, collectivities, and institutions, end quote. Since the 1970s, there have been vast economic, social, and political changes throughout the world. Brinton's vision of a non-hierarchical and free society, however, remains as valid and as necessary as it ever was. David Goodwood. And that's the end of the book. I read the introduction last and read the essays first. And I would say it was a good read. I'm thinking about writing a graduate student master's program. I'm thinking about writing a dissertation on Maurice Brinton. So that was part of the motivation for reading all his essays. But uh, I don't know if I'll actually do that or not. But I haven't started grad school yet. Maybe that will be discouraged by my academic advisor. Anyway, but thanks for listening to all these, or if you haven't yet listened to all the essays that I uploaded by Maurice Brinton, check one out. I particularly recommend uh, The Bolsheviks and Workers' Control. I think that is a tremendous uh, work, and I think it actually, from what I understand, if you know anything about like Soviet, Soviet history in terms of like authors who have written on Soviet history, um, one is the... Uh, one of them is this guy, Stephen A. Smith, who edited, uh, for one, he wrote the very short introduction to the Russian Revolution from Oxford, and I think he, and he also wrote the, he also edited both the Cambridge and the Oxford histories of communism. I think for the Ox, the Cambridge one, he might have only edited the first volume. Anyway, if you watch his video, um, talking about his book Red Petrograd, nineteen or Red. I don't know what the actual title is. I think the book is called Red Petrograd. I don't know what the subtitle is. If you um, if you listen to him talk about uh, uh listen to the video of him on Simon Baran, uh, Parani's uh, Social Histories of Revolution that's on YouTube, which I can't recommend going through those videos and listening to them hard uh, enough. Anyway, but if you see the Stephen A. Smith, who was uh, Simon Perani's uh, doctorate advisor, I believe, Stephen Smith, he talks about how his interpretation of economic events was at least at a time, maybe it changed after a period, but he definitely references Maurice Brinton's Bolsheviks and workers' control in that video. If not the book, then Maurice Brinton himself. And uh, I think that kind of speaks to the way... Uh, the impact that Maurice Brinton might have had uh, over English left politics if the uh, one of the top scholars of Bolshevism coming from, or one of the top scholars of communism coming from a sort of left uh, perspective, um, he described himself at least historically as a libertarian Marxist, uh, Stephen Smith did, if this guy has, who's editing all the books was highly influenced by this guy who was not a professional historian, I think that really speaks to the impact of that book, and I really recommend that anybody who's interested in studying uh, where the Russian Revolution went wrong should really, really pour into those that, that audio book that I have up there, or just read the book, buy the book from AK Press, and get to it yourself. And if you don't like the way that I pronounce words wrong, you should go kill yourself. <laughs>